This month, I'm going to talk with you about loving ordinary, regular daily life. Not waiting for the celebration times, the birthdays, the Christmas, the holidays, or vacation, to come alive, but to come alive, and to feel full joy, and God's presence, walking through a Walmart at night. That is the way that the spiritual person lives the ordinary daily life. Winston Churchill once said an optimist sees opportunity in every calamity. A pessimist sees calamity in every opportunity. Michelangelo said the greatest danger for most of us is not that we aim too high and we miss it, but that we aim too low and we reach it. How about loving ordinary life in rush hour traffic? I was in rush hour the other day, and I watched the faces of the people around me. They were blank, they were pale, they were stone cold. It was the type of thing that they were bored, and they were wondering how could they get through this, and they were doing their best. They were reading newspapers, one man was shaving, Two were eating takeout, five were talking on cell phones and drinking coffee all at the same time, and I thought to myself, whoa, I don't want that fellow behind me or in front of me or even beside me reading the sports page and not aware of what is going on. Well, these are our brothers and sisters. These are God's children. But what about the promise of fulfillment, the promise of great glory, the promise of God's joy? What is happening to that in ordinary, regular, daily life? I'm going to look at some stories with you today. Uh, some stories are from the Bible. You hear the story of David, who slew the giant Goliath with five stones. You hear the story about Jacob who had such fantastic adventures. In the New Testament, we hear a wonderful story about the prodigal son. The young man said to his father, I don't want to wait until your death before I share in your riches. Well, that sounds like something my children would say to me. Can you imagine saying this in today's world? The father did what the son wanted. The son went off. The son had high times. And while the money lasted, but the money didn't last, it never does. And he found himself in deep problems. As a matter of fact, he found himself so deep in the pits that for a good Jewish boy, he had to endure the most humbling experience of all. And that was feeding the pigs. He wasn't even allowed to eat the pig slop. That was about as low as a person could get. And he started his journey home. He prepared to be his father's servant, no longer a member of his household. The father comes out to meet him while he is approaching and doesn't do what you would think. He puts a ring on his finger, shoes on his feet, a beautiful cloak on his back, and tells the servant to kill the fatted calf because there is going to be a celebration. Jesus even said, when one returns to the fold, God rejoices. But what about the ones who never left the fold? I want to share with you a story that you may or may not remember about one of the forgotten people of the Bible, the prodigal son's brother. He had been out in the field while his brother was approaching the house, and he, he had been working with the servants to make sure that the crops were being attended to. On his way back to the house, probably hungry, probably tired, he then hears all this racket uh, at, the, at the house. Let me read to you from the 15th chapter of Luke. Luke 15, 25 through 31. 
Now his elder son was out in the field, and when he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing. He called to one of the slaves and said, What is going on? And he replied, Your brother has come, and your father has killed the fatted calf, because he has got him back safe and sound. And then he became angry and refused to go in. His father came out and began to plead with him, but he answered the father, Listen, for all these years I have been working like a slave for you. I've never disobeyed your commandment. You have never given me even a young goat so that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came back, who has devoured your property with wild friends, you killed the fatted calf for him. And then the father said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. All I want is to ask you this, was that your younger brother, the older son, aware that he was always with the father? Cut. What I want to ask you is this, was that older brother, the older son, aware that he was always with his father and all that his father had was his or did he carry with him a constant resentment uh, that, that was a burden to him? It sounds to me like there was a lot of resentment there. A lot of the older brother comparing his life with his brother's life and feeling that he was coming up on the short end. That is what life can be about, too. We take that hunger and we try to satisfy it with achievements, accomplishments, and things, and often that does not work. A great philosophy was expressed in the newspaper comic page, Ziggy is coming around a corner, and heading toward that corner is a man carrying a sign that says, happiness is just around the corner. Ziggy said, gee, I must have missed it. <laughs> Is life like that for you? My answer to that is probably from time to time. Spirituality is what you make of it day by day. Becoming fully awake, fully aware. Spirituality absolutely loves and savors the regular ordinary days as much as the extraordinary. A woman said, I remember the day my heart did open, and I read the words, I am a child of God, and every moment God's life, love, wisdom, and power flow through me. I am one with God, and I'm governed by God's law. I had to grab onto my chair because I felt like it was going through me, like a surge of power, of upliftment. And then she said, I went back to my ordinary life. I went back to doing the same old things that I do every single day. She said, I remember other things. I also read during those days things like, there is nothing in the universe for me to fear. Greater is the presence of God with me than anything that is in the world. And I remember believing with all my heart and saying, Wow, do you remember feeling spiritual power like that? Do you recognize that if you want to, you can feel it again right now? I often wonder what would life be like if we could read each other's minds. I tend to think that we would see a commonality in the things that we are each secretly ashamed of, and that would make us smile. We all make mistakes, and because we all make mistakes, and because we all criticize ourselves for those mistakes, I want to share 
a story with you about a mistake that seemed like a good idea at the time. This is called The Far Side of Life Comes to Oregon. Well, I'm absolutely not making this up, the writer said. In fact, I have it all on DVD. The video is from a local news station in Oregon. They sent a reporter out to cover the removal of a 45-foot, 8-ton dead whale that washed up on the beach. Well, the responsibility for getting rid of the carcass was placed on the Oregon State Highway Division, apparently on the theory that highways and whales are very similar in the sense that they are both large objects. The highway engineers hit upon the idea of a plan of blowing up the whale with dynamite, thinking that the whale would be blown into small pieces which would then be eaten by the seagulls, and that would be a textbook whale removal. So they moved the spectators up on the beach, put a half ton of dynamite next to the whale, and set it off. Now, I am probably not guilty of understatement, said the writer, when I say that what follows on the DVD is the most wonderful event in the history of the universe. First, you see the whale carcass disappear in a huge blast of smoke and flame. And then you hear the happy spectators shouting, Yay! Wee! And then suddenly, the crowd's tone changes. You hear a sound like splurt. You hear a woman's voice shouting, Here comes a piece of, oh no! And then something actually smears the camera lens. Later, the reporter explains, the humor of the entire situation suddenly gave way to a run for survival as huge chunks of whale blubber fell everywhere. One piece caved in the roof of a car parked a half mile away. Remaining on the beach were several rotting whale sections the size of condominium units. There was no sign of seagulls, who had probably, no doubt, relocated to Brazil. The writer goes on to say this is a very sobering video. Here at the Institute, we watch it often, especially at parties. See, my friend, we've all made mistakes. I've made mistakes. And later on, way after the mistake is over, we tell funny stories about them. Sure, we make mistakes, and we think those mistakes define us, but they do not. God defines us. Do you remember how God defined us? It goes back to the first chapter of Genesis 1.26, where God said, Let us make humankind in our image according to our likeness. We forget that, don't we? As a matter of fact, after the Great Awakening, which is sometimes called the Fall, what did Adam and Eve do? They hid. People say that there is not much humor in the Bible, but when you look at the third chapter of Genesis, you have to think about that is, well, that's kind of funny. If God is God, how could Adam and Eve hide from God and do it successfully? They're there, crouched behind a bush, and God comes looking for them and says, Adam, Adam, where are you? And Adam tries to keep quiet, and finally God finds him, he set a pattern for all of humankind. We've been trying to hide ever since. I know a few people that say that they share everything, all their thoughts with God, but not very many. Most of us are afraid that if God really knew what was in our heart of hearts, we might not receive God's love anymore or that we might not be worthy of being loved moment see God does not punish God never did it is time that we own this truth in our mature spirituality we as humans punish ourselves 
It's also time that we begin to be aware of the presence of God's love that is always with us. The presence of God fills the room that you're in this very moment. The presence of God stays with you every single moment where you are, even on an ordinary day. It is a holy place. Jacob, after his mother told him that he should get out of town because his brother was going to kill him, because Jacob stole his brother's birthright and his brother was upset, he left to a place called Beersheba. Spiritually, Beersheba is a place where your faith begins to take its proper role in your life, where it begins to rule. He was heading towards Haran, which spiritually means a place of higher spiritual consciousness, a place of elevated thought. That is the place where most of us are right now. Our faith has begun its process of taking hold. Otherwise, you wouldn't be watching this video. And we are each on our way to higher awareness of God. Genesis 28, 11 through 17. He came to a certain place and stayed there for the night, because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones of the place, he put it under his head and laid down in the place. And he dreamed that there was a ladder set up on earth, the top of it reaching to heaven. The angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And the Lord stood beside him and said, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie I will give to you and to your offspring, and your offspring shall be like the dust of the earth, and you shall spread abroad to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south, and all the families of the earth shall be blessed in you and in your offspring." Now, he had just stolen his brother's birthright, and yet God was telling him that by him, all the families of the earth are going to be blessed. Know that I am with you, it goes on, and I will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land, for I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. This was just an ordinary place, a clearing in the road with a stone for a pillow and a beautiful insight. His response to this insight is what is important. Then Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. The next verse is probably even more telling. And he was afraid and said, How awesome is this place! This is none other than the house of the Lord, and this is the gate of heaven. I'm going to give you a challenge right now, my friend. I invite you to take this thought and use it with you in your life in some of the places that you do not consider especially sacred. It is written above some church doors. I actually saw this crudely written in a storefront church once. It said, This is the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. At the time, I was so arrogant as to not believe the possibility that it could be so. You see, the storefront was in the midst of a slum, and it was hardly an attractive place. They called that the gate of heaven? <laughs> but maybe it was. Maybe any place can be. And maybe any activity that is spiritual and holy can be there. I do not know what you're going through today, whether it's something wonderful or something very ordinary, very mundane. But I do know that whatever you are going to do, 
whatever and however you do it, God is there. Walt said, to me, every hour of the day and the night is an unspeakable, perfect miracle. You see, that is real life. What we call real life is only a part of life because it so often leaves God out. I would like you to take the thought with you that I shared with you a bit ago. I am a child of God and every moment when I'm taking a shower, tying my shoes, washing the dishes, when I'm sitting in a traffic jam, God's life, love, and wisdom and power flow into and through me. God is found. Spirituality is found in the midst of doing ordinary things. Spirituality, my friend, is about our awareness. The gift has been given. God said, Child, you are always with me, and all that I have is yours. It is up to us to respond. What an invitation. Think about it. I wish you, my friend, a regular ordinary day, but filled with the presence of God. God bless you.